Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of law.mit.edu's IdeaFlow. Um, and this time we have actually created some slides. Um, are these slides coming through? Anybody? Yep, great. Um, episode 13 is on a topic that we have discussed a great deal um, over, over time but we have not yet delved into in, in a truly legit way, and that is the very concept of legal engineering. And uh, with us is, you know, frankly, the, the best person I can imagine to walk us through what this topic is and, and what it could be, namely um, Michael Zargam, uh, who's the founder and chief engineer at Block Science. Um, and I also know him in his context as being a core member of the Metagov project. And um, he's what I would consider a proper engineer, an engineer's engineer. Um, and to get us into it, uh, if, if you lack the context, uh, what we want to do is explore the concept of legal engineering from a range of perspectives. Um, engineers and lawyers are specially trained professionals who apply their expertise ostensibly on behalf of society, according to codes of ethics. Um, both disciplines work within the boundaries of standard procedures, but must also exercise judgment regarding particular circumstances. Engineers manage technical complexity, whereas lawyers manage legal complexity. But the, those two domains are becoming increasingly intertwined. And then I've added a little bit more context uh, for, for you, Michael. Uh, and uh, the first is um, we're coming from or through law.mit.edu's um, kind of media arm of the computational law report. Um, and that is situated at the media lab, but also at a um, part of MIT uh, called IDSS. Um, the, um, hold on a second. I'll have to pull up the page. Institute for Data Systems and Society. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted to really emphasize here is this word systems. Um, and within and that's partly why the um, computational law um, is, is in that group. Um, and similarly, um, SDM. is another example at MIT of, um, of, uh, of, of systems design, uh, in this case, more leaning toward management than um, technology or law per se. Um, but uh, the, and it's out of Sloan, um, primarily. And what's interesting about that is, it's another good example of systems and uh, in, a, in a business and societal context, and that's not a bad way to think about where law generally fits. Um, I think it's notable that there are a lot of types of engineering, which is partly what I'm bringing up here. And um, you know, I think uh, when Michael and I were talking about legal engineering and you know just kind of what it is, um, it was very obvious that there's arguably not a, a very satisfyingly deep answer to the question, what is engineering to start with? We have to understand it in the context of the type of engineering it is. And, uh, and if you do a Google search on types of engineering, they'll come up with a, a, a rollicking cacophony of different perspectives of how many types of engineering there are. Uh, the fewest I found was five, the most I found was 38. Um, and so it, it depends on how you parse them, but, you know, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, um, you know, software engineering, et cetera. But there is an idea of systems engineering and there's a budding idea of legal engineering. And so I'm hoping, and then just to, to finish it with like the inevitable reference from Wikipedia, just to at least get us started. And so, and I think it's pretty, it's pretty legit. Engineering's the creative application of science mathematical methods and empirical evidence to the innovation, design, construction, operation, and maintenance, um, and I might add, and retirement, um, of structures, machines, materials, devices, systems, processes, and organizations. 
hmm, systems, processes, and organizations. I think we can find a lot of law in there and legal systems and rules. Structures, structures too. I think structures, structures is important, but we'll come back to it. Yes, thank you. Uh, and that's partly why we have you here to actually get, to fill us in from everything that we don't currently know and think. Uh, the term engineering derived from the Latin um, in it's been many years since I took Latin, but I'm just going to take a swipe at this. Ingenium, meaning cleverness, and ingenere, uh, meaning to contrive or devise. And actually, I see Chris is with us, who is, I believe, a, a Latin speaker. So feel free to come off mute and, and correct me if, if, uh, if you please. So don't, don't feel the need to answer any of these, but these are some of the questions that were rattling in the back of my head when, when I knew we'd have an opportunity to talk. Like what, from your perspective, is what's engineering and an engineer in context, especially in your world um, through block science, but maybe more broadly. Um, what, what, might, what might be the role of a legal engineer? Like what would be our role on a project? What would be our role in a company? Like where would we fit in the org chart? Like in, in whose domain or, or whatever? Uh, what are the outputs of a legal engineer? I mean, I know the outputs of a um, architect are like blueprints, schematics, um, specs, you know, for whatever. What are the outputs of a legal engineer? Um, and, and what what are legal engineering, what's, what's legal engineering vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, tech um, and uh, engineering and business engineering? Like, where does it fit in, in that schema? And finally, what kind of skills and practices like would legal engineers possess? I said should, which is, a, I'm gonna fix that right now, might. Um, yeah, that's much more the spirit of it. And so with that, uh, those are some just um, some, you know, table setting things, but I, I hope that you'll maybe start us off just with maybe a slightly deeper introduction of who you are as Zargum, and then, you know, please take it away. Like what, what are your thoughts on the, on the notion of legal engineering? Sure, this is super exciting. Um, yeah, so first point of reference is uh, I have four engineering degrees. Um, one of them is a liberal arts degree from Dartmouth and three of them are in the sort of domain of robotics and control, which is um, actually technically electrical and systems engineering. Um, and I, I'll come back to systems engineering in a bit, but I've worked on a wide range of systems, including um, sort of robotics systems, aerospace systems. I've worked on business systems. And today I work predominantly on organizational structures and market designs. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania with Ali Judd Babai, who's actually um, on the uh, IDSS faculty at MIT now. So there's a nice connection there. Um, and I believe he's affiliated with the civil engineering department, which is um, actually kind of interesting because one of the things I want to dig into today is that um, the type of engineering, the classification of at least within the scope of existing engineering fields that legal engineering seems to fit for me is much closer to civil engineering because you are um, actually providing um, structures that um, in a sense, uh, organize society for other people to act within. Um, and the civil engineering field essentially already does that. Uh, it's the physical space that you're structuring, but as the world that we live in becomes increasingly digital or digitally intermediated, then a lot of our digital infrastructures are civil infrastructures. And a lot of those digital infrastructures are actually uh, extensions of um, legal infrastructures or sort of structuring um, rules for the interactions, whether it's agreements or contracts, organizations, or um, even to some extent, um, sort of government-like bodies that are managing, um, you know, often in the blockchain world, we hear people talking about um, provisioning public goods. Again, this is a, a sort of a governmental function, at least in a legacy system. So sort of, I'm going to place us in this category of digital civil engineering, because that's the way that I've sort of come to identify. So if we're talking about me, I'm saying, well, I'm a digital civil engineer uh, insofar as such a thing exists. And it turns out that civil engineers work really closely with lawyers. So um, I'm going to probably take that as the launch point into discussing what is engineering, um, unless there's any other. And we do questions as we go, Daza, or do you want to do um, sort of yeah, in this case, I, I think the best thing would be if you kind of got a head of steam going and, and you know, drop some some context <laughs> and knowledge on us and then let okay. that seed the questions. And then maybe we will intersperse them um, after after you've had an opportunity to kind of get some cool. 
So why don't you throw the slide back up with the sequence of questions? I'll use that as a scaffold because I'm notoriously rambly. Some of you know me, and I'm going to uh, borrow Daz's outline as a way to make sure I stay on the track that we want to be on here. So um, what is engineering? Um, this is pretty challenging, as Daza um, pointed out, but I, I find it to be useful to take multiple perspectives. So one perspective on engineering is just like really reductive. It's making stuff. But the truth is it needs to be distinguished from sort of just um, making stuff in a fabrication or manufacture perspective, because although a lot of people who are engineers do make stuff, it's the actual um, the thinking about and the designing and the sort of articulating what it is you hope to accomplish by designing that sort of wraps around the act of making stuff that I think is sort of really the essence of engineering. Um, and for that, um, in practice, we end up with a, a decomposition from a sort of the functional perspective or, or, you know, what are you intending to accomplish when you design, develop, and even operate main, and maintain something um, versus the process through which you um, design and test and deploy and even maintain something. Um, and so uh, just because this has got a nice uh, connection to the, the legal language, I'm gonna call the procedural part, well, I'm gonna call the part that's process oriented procedural, meaning I'm going to follow the engineering design process and I'm going to gather or produce some sort of requirements and I'm going to you know, build and test against those things. Um, I don't really wanna go on a long tangent about engineering processes. So what matters here is there are pretty dedicated processes on a sort of meta level, but also within the specific engineering domain, the kinds of processes and procedures that make that work um, you know, let's say quality isn't necessarily the right word, but it's like legitimate in the sense that you did the engineering work according to the, the known best practices and procedures for that field, but that process and procedure or best practice can actually change over time because it's not a particularly static field. And that's quite distinct from an ends justify the means view, which we might say is more functional, which is, did I accomplish the, the goals that I set out to? Um, who, am I, who am I serving and did I, did I serve them um, as intended? Um, if we place the, the functional and the procedural side by side, we might see that the procedural, um, I guess procedural is procedural, functional is more substantive. It's like, did we accomplish what we hope to accomplish? And did it really matter how we got it done if we got it done? Um, and I think placing those two things in contrast and recognizing that um, an engineer is actually gonna make quite a few subjective decisions about you know, what is appropriate um, work in order to ensure that the outcomes are met in a like sort of safe and appropriate way. Um, and and I'm, I'm kind of trying to explore this gap between engineering as I followed all the steps versus engineering, I produced the intended outcome, sort of ends versus means, um, and sort of process versus substance of the work. And if people are engaged in making subjective choices about um, you know, when and to what extent certain activities are appropriate, inevitably you end up with this third perspective, which I call the institutional perspective. And honestly, this is the one that is most important to me. This institution of engineering is sort of, um, it's constituted of a bunch of shared values and principles around uh, ser like service to the public. And generally um, it exists in this thing called um, the Cicero's Creed, or it's the, or I should say, this is like the sort of oldest engineering creed, which it basically says that you put the, um, the public safety or the public good above all other considerations. And if you sort of take that as a, sort of principle that underwrites the entire social engine, the social institution of engineering, and it manifests itself in any number of um, like licensing style and um, regulation of engineering activities, whether it appears in different um, organizations like the IEEE's codes of ethics, they, this, this notion pervades. And I think 
the understanding that an engineer, at least an engineer's engineer, is someone who not only understands the, um, the substantive and procedural aspects of designing things and, and developing and maintaining them, but also understands that they're making subjective choices, design decisions, or even impositions on those who would interact with the things that they've created, that that comes with a um, sort of a, a requirement for like an ethical introspection, like what am I doing to who to whose benefit, and you know what is my obligation to the public? And so I would sort of wrap up the part star one by saying that you know engineering is made up of both procedural and substantive elements related to the design, development, and maintenance, um, and even potentially governance of of things that other people are going to use, and that the um, the institutional layer of the field of engineering is the sort of values and principles that underwrite a relatively distributed set of engineering organizations and um, even sort of licensing programs across different jurisdictions. And because that engineering um, institution is greater than any individual, say, regulatory body or professional organization, um, it's probably best to think of it as a social institution. Um, is that good for a starting point? That is really good. And may I um, um, just go put a, I want to go back and emphasize two dimensions of what you said, um, because we want, also want to create a record here that we can build on, you know, over the, well, hopefully years. Um, and so one of them is back to the, the process oriented aspect of an engineer and engineering. Um, do you, does so in schools they teach a lot of um, engineering design process is kind of like you know, required um, part of a curriculum and it's always something like ask imagine plan uh, create or like prototype and improve and then you know with a few more or less steps in there uh, and so I wanted to ask uh, would do you imagine legal engineering would would kind of fall in line with that sort of engineering process uh, as well, but in a different domain? Yeah, so I think the important thing to understand is that what you were just describing is really um, like abstracted. So it doesn't really matter what material you're acting upon. Your, your early stages are about framing the problem. And as I'm sure lawyers know, whoever frames the problem really gets to determine what the solution is going to be. And so um, the reason why you can't skip those early stages is that if you um, naively frame the problem, or maybe don't even realize how you frame the problem, you're going to get a solution that I guess seems right relative to your requirements, but it may not actually do what you want in the world. And this is a issue we see even with software all the time. People jump straight into building software before knowing what they actually wanted it to accomplish in a sufficiently specific degree that they end up with software and it does stuff, but it may not do anything like what they actually wanted from a say business or legal requirements perspective. And I think we'll come back to placing, you know, business legal and technical requirements together near the end. I think it's something that you and I resonated with when we first met Daza. Um, but in terms of the engineering design process, yeah, the, this relatively stylized um, sort of meta process is good for learning. There's actually a version of it in like a child's book that I've been reading to my two-year-old daughter. And I got to the bottom of this last page and it's in there and I was like, fell over laughing because I realized that there was something in my two-year-old's book that I sometimes have to explain to my clients. And that, that just made me laugh a little bit. Um, That's brilliant. So, uh, so to extract, to, just to make sure we're tracking, what I got from that is, yeah, um, this highly abstract thing is it, is it but um, the, the condensed version I mentioned, which starts with the word ask, yeah. really needs to be leaned into and it needs to be define and validate what the requirements are and what the goals and objectives are. Hopefully, we'll have time to come back a little bit yeah. to an advanced look on that from Sandy Puntman and his, um, his approach on uh, legal algorithms, really starting with a statement of the objectives that we can measure. Yeah. Uh, okay, I got it. Yeah, and I think, you know, for, for leveling up, uh, it's a very good idea to look at things like systems engineering and model-based systems engineering, and in particular, things like the verification and validation V, which allow for a degree of nesting. So you end up with something that's a 
properly applied is a, a mixture of agile and waterfall processes because there's some things that have to be ordered. They simply like need a degree of, they have a degree of temporal dependence, but that you still want to chunk your problem up into like little pieces that you can rapidly iterate on because, you know, everyone knows if you try to like create this big directed acyclic graph of dependencies and march through it that your project's going to take 15 years. And so if you want things to get done, you need to operate in a relatively agile way. But when projects get too big or they have certain dependencies, purely agile development starts to break down because it doesn't adequately manage, uh, manage those dependencies. So when you get into sort of systems engineering, you're going to be dealing with, um, you know, sort of a, a blend of managing dependencies between components, rolling up components into whole systems, and managing requirements that are both sort of internal to a component, as well as sort of interfaces, component to component, as well as um, sort of part to whole and kind of whole to part relationships. And so you get a kind of networked view of codependencies or requirements. And as you move into things like organizations or large scale infrastructures or automations, there's really no way to get around um, doing this engineering design process in a sort of networked and recursive way. So you really want to get your head around it because it's actually a primitive, even though it seems like it's, it's an assemblage itself, you need to be able to both nest it and network it in order to get a big project done. That's really helpful. Can I interject one thing? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just um, very quickly, um, just so you know where we're starting, at least um, in my own part of uh, MIT, we since the late 90s have been trying to do legal use cases, kind of starting with UML, but we've and then business use cases. And now we've got a little bit of nomenclature and that's kind of taken off a bit. And then in the last 10 or 15 years, we've really gotten deeper into swim lane diagrams, partly because they let you do role separation. And when you have a role, you know, there's a there's like a usually a business or a technical dimension of the role. It's like a user and a server or whatever, or the provider. And there may be a business like a whatever, like a buyer and a seller or an employer and employee. But there's also a legal name we can assign to each role, like licensor, licensee or whatever, you know, buyer. Sometimes they collapse with the business ones. But we found these two kind of baby steps to be a good way to start to get into a verifiable um, one, um, statement of the goals of a system that we're building, um, but number two, a way to align and harmonize with the technical um, hardcore engineering and the business um, kind of dimensions as well. But this is only like the, uh, the, like, uh, the, the tip of the iceberg of the engineering process design that you were describing. Uh, but anyway, um, I think uh, Brenton had an interjection, uh, if that was his yeah. voice. Yeah. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm in my car. Uh, I'll be short. The interjection here is, uh, you're spot on, Michael. Testability, uh, the point here is that uh, the, the, the design, the dynamics, the structure, these interplays with different uh, subsystems are all uh, testable. And maybe we'll come back to that later. Yeah, I, I also like to riff on something that um, Daza just said about the uh, roles. So actually, um, in, a, in an engineering context, we often talk about functions. And so in uh, when I'm organizing things that are going to have, um, say, legal components or legal interpretations, um, I generally um, map out functions and then design roles to fulfill functions rather than start with roles. Um, and when you actually get a sense of what you're trying to accomplish, you'll figure out what the constituent functions are and then start finding the minimalist way to fulfill all the functions. And then you might look at ways to create um, resilience through a degree of redundancy or some checks and balances. But ultimately, your you know, thing you are, I guess, constituting is going to need to fulfill on an ongoing basis a bunch of functions that have codependencies with each other. And so just understanding what all the functions are and what their dependencies are, both in terms of what they need from each other and how one function might provide, say, goals or receive outputs from sort of input output view um, uh, relationship between different functions. And so a lot of mapping. So I definitely agree with the swim lanes and roles and um, some of the, the tools that you're bringing forth. Uh, I generally, though, will almost inevitably start with uh, um, that 
framing that we discussed earlier and then from that base level framing sort of iterating into sort of identifying what is in and out of scope for a particular design defining boundary conditions and defining the functions that the thing that is being designed needs to fulfill and then when i start looking at things like roles that would mean that i'm i'm starting to um like uh, come up with a solution. Now, not entirely, because if the roles are representations of stakeholder groups, then there's a little bit of a matching going on between the stakeholder groups, which are sort of natural roles, and then maybe the creation of roles as part of what you're designing um, that helps match the stakeholders to functions and identifying goals, not just at the system as a whole, but potentially from the perspective of multiple stakeholders. And I think this is where we start to get into the legal engineering category, because as we're building um, in particular, um, designing organizations and or software, and most often, in my case, organizations that are partially constituted of software, um, we have to look at a bunch of different uh, stakeholders and their potentially conflicting goals, because this is where some of my particular area of study comes in, which is resource allocation algorithms, because at the end of the day, um, there's going to be some conflict in the preference for how constrained resources are allocated. So whether that's money or attention or even rights to do certain things, um, the, the algorithms in organizations that are sort of partially constituted of software end up solving um, these kind of multi-stakeholder resource allocation problems. Um, it could be collective decision-making, it can be um, sort of financial resource uh, both procurement and um, like assignment to specific initiatives. It can be a wide range of things. But what you'll start to notice is that although we may be building software to meet some of these use cases or to, to facilitate um, the allocation of resources, um, that is still actually very much in the um, the legal domain or at least the legal adjacent. You're still forming organizations that have um, legal standing in some cases, you are um, almost certainly doing things that um, you have legal compliance requirements for, and you are ultimately, quote, structuring the field of action. And, and this is why I, I, I pointed out the term structures in the engineering definition, because I'm a particular fan of um, the Foucault uh, governance definition, which is structuring the field of action for others. Um, I, I learned that one from L.A. Rennie, who's a collaborator from RMIT, and I found it really compelling because I realized that, you know, in civil engineering, you're like literally structuring the field of action, like you are going out and creating space for certain types of economic activity. You know, when you really think about what a, a road or a bridge is, they are, they are economic infrastructure. People and goods move over them. And honestly, in a, a pre-digital era, they filled very similar functions to, um, you know, digital systems that move, um, you know, basically money and effort between organizations and between people. So I, I tend to like, I can kind of zoom in on this idea of economic, social and economic infrastructure, and then recognize that um, legal contracts, agreements, and organizations are effectively social and economic infrastructure. It gets structured, they provide affordances, people get to interact according to certain rules, but they also have restrictions on what they, what they can do or what they're you know, ostensibly allowed to do with maybe the main caveat being that where enforcement in the traditional sort of physical world often comes back to some sort of dispute resolution or some sort of dispute making and dispute resolution in a software system um, short hacking, there's a relatively high degree of enforcement implicit in the infrastructure. So I can't really drive on the wrong side of the road, the road sort of, you know, the equivalent, the digital equivalent of the road, like doesn't give me that option. Um, the admissible actions are effectively um, coded into these systems, or you might say that they're more complete. Um, the physical world is more incomplete in that um, I can, uh, I can more fully specify um, what one can do and what happens when they do it when you're working in software. Um, but actually the consequence of this is that often things are overspecified. And I think we've got um, Megan on who recently gave a, a nice presentation at, um, the, at Codex about rebranding vagueness as um, 
elasticity. And I'm actually a big fan of elasticity um, insofar as when writing um, algorithms or producing software that is intended to fulfill, um, you know, structuring the field of action like um, functions, then we actually have to really carefully make space. Like otherwise things are vastly overdetermined and things that are vastly overdetermined are at least in the physical world, very fragile. So if there's no flex or give in something, there's a really good chance it's going to break. And so, you know, to kind of come back to what is the role of a legal engineer, I, I would argue that their, their job is to um, provide the engineering um, methodology and the substantive like trade-off decision analysis and selection of structures in the in the legal material. And I think I'm going to use that term material because as someone who's worked on say robotics, like we had teams with mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer engineers, and a lot of different experts needed to come together in order to make a complete project that fulfilled its function that, you know, in this case, the robot got deployed to uh, Greenland and then Antarctica with the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, that experience of working in an interdisciplinary engineering team sort of lends you to realize that some of the core principles of engineering are sort of irrespective of the material that you're working in and that any particular project is going to need different materials depending on what your optimization is what your what your goals are and also what your constraints are actually and one of the nice things about bringing the the legal engineer into the mix is that i think especially with these digital systems we tend to forget about constraints um we don't necessarily think about codifying what one can't do and um or maybe better yet we say one can do all of these things, and then we also might layer in some principles or some, some values, something that we couldn't code that's naturally incomplete. And if we wanna try to bring some of these concepts into our designs, we're gonna need um, engineering professionals who um, sort of have a, an expertise of that medium. But we'll ultimately end up placing the requirements from the legal domain in parity with requirements from the technical and business. I usually use the term economics, but DAZA has a, a great acronym. It's BLT, Business Legal Technology. And I've been you know, talking with my teams, which tend to be um, working on projects, not necessarily for a specific business, but for uh, an ecology. And so we generally think of it as economics rather than business requirements, because we want, uh, we do a little bit of market design, a little bit of mechanism design. But in the end, since we have N stakeholders in most of these problems, we'll look at that as an economy rather than as a business, because a business I tend to think of as having the business objectives or the business requirements for the business, whereas an economy might have to have requirements for, you know, two to five stakeholder groups, and they need to be in balance in a way that actually um, processes the information that's brought forth by the individual actors within that system. And so I tend to lean into um, the signal processing, network signal processing as a way of understanding markets so that the, the information is drawn from, the, uh, from the, those interacting within the market rather than being kind of imposed upon them. It's, it's not a magic oracle, it's a, a sense-making institution. And in particular, if you think of it in formal terms, it's a kind of uh, dynamic network doing signal processing. Um, and I have a lot of opinions about how what, what that analogy or that formalism tells us about how markets may or may not be structured. But it's convenient to notice that even when designing markets, um, the term structured is also present. So we see some overlap in the technical, the business or economics, and the legal domain in this term structure. In all cases, we are structuring something. And so um, I'm, I'm arguing effectively that uh, that's what we all have in common. We're structuring this field for others. And that when we actually do these bigger projects that involve, you know, business or economic requirements, legal requirements, and technical requirements, that the software engineers or other en technical engineers, that the people thinking about the, the business or economics and the people thinking about the legal requirements actually come together to sort of come up with, to design, and that means 
I guess, frame first, frame the problem statement. What are we trying to accomplish for whom? Pick some tools and start to lay out a structuring and that the enterprise of engineering, in this case, the sort of business systems engineering, or maybe it's, um, you know, the sort of meta on engineering that we're undertaking with our lawyers, our technologists, and our economists or, or business people um, is, is one of, of structuring for others to act within. Um, and so I'm going to pause there again for a second, because I think we have some questions coming up. But mm -hmm. I, at least for me, that's why these things are so consonant, that we're, we're doing structuring for others. That's great. Thank you for coming back, as you had promised, to that word structuring that I just sort of skated right over. And that it, I see what you mean in terms of it having a lot of explanatory power in terms of you know what, what we're doing and, and how it relates. Um, one quick uh, reflection on what you said, and then let's get right to the questions, uh, which is you brought something up that's particularly um, and a particularly important dynamic, I think, with this idea of how legal engineering could work and how it could fit into the the other um, disciplines of engineering on a project. Um, and it's when you talked about um, the typical go to level of abstraction uh, in your team is economic um, and the broader systems. And you, if you looked at Sandy Pentland's um, perspective on legal algorithms piece, you'll see that's very um, prevalent um, frame of reference uh, from our home lab as well. Uh, we look at you know larger scale systems, you know markets and you know big populations, that kind of thing. Um, and you're quite right to point out that this particular take of BLT is literally a lower level of abstraction. It's more specific. Um, and, uh, and part of that's just an artifact that before I got to MIT, I did you know commercial work, and I think in terms of businesses and structuring transactions and that sort of stuff at that level that only exists within systems and that only operates with even further granularity in terms of specific transactions and, you know, and, and small, more granular things. Uh, and, um, and the, what I want the, um, I guess, insight I wanted to offer about what might be, what might require a little more thinking for successfully defining and incorporating legal engineering into the broader mix in a more organized way in the future is, this the scope and the level of abstraction is particularly important to define with legal um, dimension because people can be doing extraordinary you know contributions but they're coming from a vantage point where they might be looking at you know traffic and parking over the bridge or they might be looking at you know um, torts and fender benders or they might be looking at law enforcement in terms of how can we use the photos at the toll booth to determine that you know this um, suspect was in the car and there's a so it's just incredibly fact specific in a way yeah. that's very squirrely and needs to be um, uh, kind of defined but that's something it has in common with this that's actually the point about framing right so like we deal with multi-scale systems all the time so the systems engineer or the systems of systems engineer tends to sit in the highest level of abstraction and actually participate in some degree of modularization and maybe creating frames of reference and defining finding interactions between frames of reference. So in your case with the bridge and say we're in the, the legal subdomain of the bridge, there's gonna be some interaction effects between some specific design decisions from the technical members. Let's say we are dealing with I don't know, deciding whether or not we're going to put a hard rail between the two directions, right? So there's a, in some cases, you might just have, a, you know, two dot, two lines, painted lines. And in a, another case, you might put like an actual physical divider. So it might be that the engineers are making decisions based on the, in this case, the technical people who are um, making choices about maybe traffic patterns, which is a little closer to economics than it is to the, the actual physical materials. So we might have some people talking about the physical materials and the structural um, sort of um, properties of the bridge, thermal expansion, vibrational modes, you know, how much weight it can bear, all that. Then you might have other people worried about um, questions of, again, like traffic patterns, accident rates, etc. And that's exactly where the sort of legal interface might pop in, because you might start to have some of these subsections that you're talking about. They'll have some interactions with each other, but they'll also have cross links with um, the uh, the other 
you know, in this case, I called the traffic patterns, the economics category, but, um, you know, also the physical things, changes to the physical structure of the bridge might affect its um, physical properties. So my point about the networked and recursive view of the engineering design process should come into relief here, because that precisely gives you a view of the world where you're starting to break down the problem into a bunch of constituent engineering problems, which are codependent on each other. And your point is essentially that the legal engineering problems are also codependent with the um, economic and sort of physical technical engineering problems. And this comes back to like why we're having this discussion is that it's always seemed very strange to me that legal was in a sense, outside of that paradigm, as opposed to inside of that paradigm, as one of the engineering domains in inside of that engineering design process, rather than a thing where the sort of engineers and in this case, economists isn't quite the right term for the people who are doing traffic analysis, they're cyber physical systems engineers of various types. Um, but they're engaged in this type of, of modeling and analysis to make decisions in the in the infrastructure they're sort of a, they're still sort of following an engineering design process but my experience is that on the legal side it's just very much a uh, a guess and check it's like there's some you know regulatory frameworks and or some you know lawyers with checklists and their job is to say no until they get an answer from the engineers and the economists that they are willing to accept and one that removes a ton of efficiency from the overall design process. And two, I would argue that, that um, it also tends to sacrifice um, uh, substantive outcomes for procedural following. So like at least my experience is that the, the engineering adjacent legal work is structured into regulation-based checklists and that those checklists, although they are intended to embody um, the, the desired outcomes, they, they tend to end up um, heavy on um, you checked all the boxes and light on the reason those boxes were checked was actually accomplished. So light on spirit, heavy on, on uh, rule following. And I, I'm not saying rule following is bad, but when I view these systems holistically, I view the legal components as important, but like the substantive bit is important. I want systems that are safer and that are fairer and that those things do sort of get addressed at the level of um, the legal engineering or, or the legal experts um, domain. You've really got your finger on the pulse of part of what animates this, um, this initiative at MIT and I think more broadly, which is this recognition that um, laws very easily and very quickly seem to be subject to a kind of a socio-political entropy and they become these sort of like bureaucratic steps that we take that kind of drift ever further from the initial purpose. And then that's part of the idea of engineering and can we define the outcomes and the objectives? Can we instrument the systems that they're built into such that we can continuously measure and adapt the systems, but also adapt the rules to stay up to um, up to par and up to the moment of what our objectives are, which are not snapshots that we have to be prisoners yeah. of for all eternity, but they also evolve. Okay, but enough of my voice. Um, we have at least one hand up now by Brendan, and I want to encourage anyone else that wants to get in on this. We have 11 minutes left. This is your time. Um, and let's start with Brendan. You're up. Okay, great. Uh, Michael has uh, he's put forth a number of things that are just you know extraordinarily exciting. What I wanted to do is I wanted to say, you know, we've spoken uh, quite a bit or so, some early on about complex systems and dynamics. He's said a number of things which are really really important that I want to tie together, and then he might take the time to ex, uh, expound upon it more. But when we think about you know statute and laws, the very important thing to understand is this area that he's been discussing uh, specifically around the dynamics of a system and boundaries and constraints and how those things are related to structure. And these all things, all of these things have an interplay. And you know, the question becomes, how do you de design statutes and laws in ways in which the parts that are, are static are static and the parts that are dynamic and often that is around the messages the events the transactions etc cetera, etc cetera. those are the things that 
you want to test and engineer so that uh, there is flexibility in, in that statute over time or, or other laws, et cetera, et cetera. But this is all great, Michael, I can go on, but I, I'm not, if you could maybe at some point speak more to the, the how the dynamics can drive, an analysis of the dynamics can drive um, thinking about the legal side of this, that would be great. I can address and, it other, directly if yeah, you go ahead. like. Oh, does it, did you? Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. Anybody. So, um... Uh, in, in, in my team, um, because we do quite a bit of work with software and we have backgrounds in things like you know, me, systems engineering, one of my collaborators is in, uh, was, a, was a contract theorist, uh, computational economist, and, and, um, and many other fields. But we use something we call generalized dynamical systems, and this allows us to express the dynamics of much more complex objects than things that are not numerical. So historically, a a uh, dynamical system is defined over real valued fields. Um, we define, if you, if you look this up, you're gonna find probably not our work because we haven't pushed it out yet, but you'll find some, um, uh, some references to the concepts. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just explain. Okay, so sorry. basically, no, no. So, I so thought some, I was screen sharing my pad. Um, yeah, I wanted to speak to what you're pulling up, but I, you're, you're not going to find the publication on, on this yet because we haven't pushed it out into the public. But there's existing generalized dynamical systems concepts from the 60s. Originally, someone by the name of Roxon was the, the primary contributor. And it basically took the notion of a, of a dynamical system and then described it over like an arbitrary topological space. And like, what can you do with dynamical spaces, dynamical systems over, for lack of a better term, objects? And since we deal with lots of software systems, we just said, hey, we need dynamical systems, but we need them defined over, you know, arbitrary data structures. And so, well, arbitrary data structures are space, are effectively spaces. They, they define the set of um, values that something might take and um, methods describe the mutations of, um, uh, basically of those data structures. And then if you just need to open it up and sort of look at what kinds of activities one can take, you can take a slightly more control theoretic lens and you know, describe like a canonical form for like a nonlinear system would be something like f of x comma u returns a new point in the um, the domain X. So that's a differential, inc uh, it's a differential, um, it's a difference equation. And we tend to reason about them as differential inclusions because we end up with these inputs U drawn from some set of admissible actions. And those admissible actions themselves might be state dependent or even like actor dependent. And so we can create quite formal representations of, um, for lack of a better term, ag agreements or contracts in the form of um, data structures, and then um, the the messages that you are allowed to pass, and then the way in which those messages are um, resolved into changes in the data structures. And so you get these uh, difference equations, um, these nonlinear specifiable difference equations, and then you get um, this uh, differential inclusion where, or you know, disc discrete differential inclusion where you can see what's reachable. Um, by iteratively uh, extending the space of points you can get to from the current points. And, and that whole family of reachability analysis underwrites a lot of our um, sort of formal engineering work for things like smart contracts. But one of the things we've learned recently from talking to lawyers is that it turns out you can specify all sorts of great kinds of market structures and legal contracts and agreements using this sort of modular block diagram based thing that contains really nothing more than, um, you know, maybe a collection of data structures and then a collection of mechanisms and that those mechanisms have admissible action sets or like message spaces. And so you can also strongly type the message spaces, but you leave a lot of room for that elasticity. You're basically saying the set of all messages that can be passed to the system are, and when they are passed to the system, this happens. And you leave that incompleteness for, well, you don't know what messages are gonna come. They might come from measurements. They might come from actions of participants participants, et cetera. But the nice thing about the boundary and the sort of open or permissible 
uh, or you might say admissible, since we refer to these as the admissible inputs, this admissible um, boundary provides the, um, the way in which information gets into the system from outside. And since a large number of things within this system might be observable to the outside world or even reported on, then they actually give information back to the outside world. So we do quite a bit of design from this uh, generalized dynamical systems um, paradigm. We've been using it for several years. Um, we are starting to write some publications. I'm actually hoping to get something out in the next few months because I'm giving a, a keynote at a conference about it in July, and I want to have the paper somewhere public. Um, but in the meantime, you can sort of follow along with, um, I guess, some of the other work that we have published that actually contains references to it because we're using it. But th for me, at least, this is the the place that connects with what, what Brendan's asking about. We, we had to develop a sufficiently rich abstract formal system that was a kind of you know, dynamical systems canonical form that maybe we hope one day will sit alongside some of the other canonical forms that get used, you know, LTIs, LTVs, nonlinear systems, et cetera. Um, we just happen to construct a representation that foregoes the, um, the real valuedness and replaces it with strongly typed objects or data structures. And once we did that, we realized that a lot of the dynamical systems um, equipment can still be used. Uh, particular reachability analysis is incredibly helpful. It tells us what can happen as opposed to what will happen um, in many cases almost everything that could happen doesn't, but something that does happen could have happened. So that's great from, uh, um, you know, again, kind of bounding the possibilities. Um, we can also do things like um, analyze what the blockchain people call economic security, which is to say, given the current configuration of the system, what would it cost in monetary terms to move to another configuration? It's still inside of the um, system model. But if you look at the sequences of messages, there's a sort of shortest path in, in, in cost that you could find. So if you're worried Worried about how much it would cost to attack a system, you can ask, like, what is the cheapest set of moves from its current configuration to take it to the undesirable configuration? Um, you can also design guardrails, things that identify the precursor states to undesirable states. That's a lot like how um, cyber physical systems and sort of fail safes work anyway, right? Circuit breaker. You're like, well, I really don't want this to happen. A precursor to that happening is this. So when the system reaches this state, let me turn off those other mechanisms until it maybe re-equilibrates or to stop a um, to stop a shock or something. And so you know, there's so much that you can do within that paradigm. Um, we also do a variety of sort of signal processing tests when we we get things into software. So we develop some software called CAD CAD Complex Adaptive Dynamics Computer Aided Design, which is loosely based on this GDS, uh, Generalized Dynamical Systems Paradigm. Um, first version's been out for a couple of years. It's a little heavy from a UX perspective, and we've got a team um, currently doing a full re-implementation with an emphasis on cleaning up the UX and making the modeling language a little bit more accessible. But at the end of the day, it's effectively a a Python-based implementation of um, this GDS paradigm to make it relatively easy to mock things up and like look at what would happen if, so do run scenarios, et cetera. So um, Brendan, I mean, you're really kind of hitting my, uh, when you start asking about dynamics, you're really hitting my home territory. Um, even when we get outside of the strictly formal statements and into the more sort of conceptual stuff, I, I recently um, released a preprint of a paper connecting cybernetics uh, back to DAOs. And one of the main things that we came back to was looking at governance surfaces or the mechanisms through which you literally adapt the governance rules and what was what's reachable in that system and like how do those systems actually adapt their own rulemaking procedures over their life cycles. Fantastic. We don't have time for follow ups right now, although I think we've you've generated about 18 months worth. Um, do we have time if we can really fast um, Andre you'd had your hand up did, did you want to squeeze one last contribution in. Yeah, and now I will be very brief in order that you, you, you can use our. our... Uh, available time and uh, my formation is not engineering. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a, I have a legal formation and continent, continental uh, uh, Europe legal formation, not common law. And uh, uh, it, it, there, there was an, uh, a classical author of uh, legal theory uh, in, tel in Italian author that was Norberto Bobbio. And Norberto Bobbio 
uh, preconized the changing from the structure to the function in law, in legal theory. And it seems that, that you, you, you defend, and, and this seems possible, to return to a structure and, and mix structure and function, considering the, the new era of digital uh, evolution. And we, we have automation, legal automation, computational law, as proposed by Sam Pantland. And uh, all this, this return to the structure uh, is it possible only because we have uh, 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 the digitization of law, the digitization of, of the, the conducts and behavior? I would say that it's not possible only because I think it's leading us to make, it's making that perspective more useful again. So like if you think of the, as a, those models as perspectives, then the perspective of more carefully um, looking at structures and the functions those structures fulfill um if, if i'm understanding this this thing that you're bringing in um at least for me yeah we do a lot of um like you know structuring things to fulfill functions so if you don't understand the functions that you wish to fulfill you can't really design the right structures but just thinking about things like algorithms as structuring as you know, put deploying, designing, developing, deploying, and maintaining a set of algorithms or procedures as a sort of structuring the field of action for others is what, at least for me, brings this perspective back to focus, right? We want structures that fulfill intended functions. We don't want structures for their own sake, or you know, maybe gigantic bureaucracies that self, you know, that they they self-maintain, but potentially cease to fulfill the function from which they originally they emerged to fulfill. And 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 again, this is me being a big proponent of a lot of the functions that the bureaucracies at least originally fulfilled or are supposed to fulfill, but maybe not feeling like they're currently fulfilling them very well. And maybe we can adapt or reframe um, those institutions to maybe fulfill their functions better in part um, by recognizing the role that the digital transformation can play in restructuring those institutions and improving their capacity to fulfill their functions, which might actually start with going back and asking what were their functions in the first place? Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, well, there's a lot, <laughs> and we have some applause coming. Uh, nice icons. There's so much more to cover, and I just want to thank you, uh, really, from the uh, on behalf of the entire community, and especially the people of the future who I hope will enjoy this, uh, who don't yet know that they're going to be legal engineers, um, for your time and for your uh, generous. And, um, and really gracious um, sharing of your knowledge and expertise and pointing us in the right direction. Um, so thank you very much, Sargam. And thank you everyone who participated today in this episode of law.mit.edu's Idea Flow. See you next month. <laughs>